Keller, where does your interest in science come from? I don't know. It is my earliest memory. You know, maybe five years old, maybe six, probably not quite. Put to bed, have to go to sleep, don't want to go to sleep. You know what I do? I play with numbers. I know that there are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, so many hours in a day, etc. How many seconds in a day? How many seconds in a year? I did that. And you know, you won't be surprised to hear that every time I do it, I get an a different answer. And that makes it more interesting. And I did not tell anybody about it. Nobody told me. And it just for myself as an amusement. Quite spontaneous. And I continue to be interested in numbers, in connections. Then, when I was maybe 10 years old, my father took real notice of my interest. He did not share it. But he had a very nice retired university professor as a friend by the name of Leopold Klug. And he took me to him. He was interested in a certain branch in mathematics, projective geometry. The properties, geometrical figures that remain unchanged when you project them. You know, you project a circle, it looks like an ellipse. What is there common in the circle and in the ellipse? Problems. Problems I got from Klug, I could not solve, most of them. But still, a deep impression. Because I was sorry for grown-ups. They complained, hard work, tired after the day. Klug was the first, first person I met who obviously really and thoroughly enjoyed what he was doing. And that was what I wanted to do, enjoy what I'm doing. He also told my father to get a book on algebra, very thorough algebra from beginning to end, that Euler, a very famous mathematician, wrote some 200 years ago. My father got it. And by the time I was 11 or 12 years old, I had read it from end to end. Then I got into school. And we got the idea that mathematics is the same as calligraphy. You just have to write very neatly, then it will be all right. You know, in school, for a few years, I sort of lost interest. Then it came back. I did not get it from anybody. But my love of knowledge was entirely spontaneous. And I am now convinced that knowledge, knowledge of every kind, and the more thorough the better, is in itself good. What to do with knowledge is another matter. And in that I feel to some extent responsible. But my main interest, my basic interest has been knowledge in itself. How much? I don't know. I can tell you. It was spontaneous. My earliest in, uh, of my memories, five years old, go to bed, go to sleep. I'm bored. I begin to play with numbers. So many seconds in a minute, so many minutes in an hour, hour in a day, etc. How many seconds in a day, in a year? would do it again and again. Of course, in my head, I couldn't even write. Every time I do it, I usually get a different answer. That made it much more interesting. Then, as years went past, still a kid, I got more and more interested in numbers, in science, in facts. My father, lawyer, quite different interests, 
had a great friend, retired professor of mathematics, Klug, took me to him. Klug, you know, was the first grown-up who was thoroughly interested in what he was doing. His topic was projective geometry. When you look at a circle from the side, it looks like an ellipse. What are the common properties of a circle and an and ellipse? Problems, couldn't solve them. But Klug was enthusiastic. The one grown up who liked to do what he wanted to. And that's what I wanted to do. In school, I did not get much out of mathematics. But as I get, got to college, that was my whole interest to know more and more about facts. And I am quite convinced that more knowledge is good. Understanding is good. What to do with the understanding? Different matter. Important. Responsibility. But the greater interest, the greater love for my part, was in knowledge itself. I had a very good friend, a Hungarian, 10 years older than I, Theo Silat. He had a very independent mind and a great feeling what is coming. He saw years ahead that nuclear explosives would become important. He was a friend and I helped him. For instance, I drove him to an important interview with Einstein where Einstein wrote the famous letter to Roosevelt that started things going. I myself was interested in theoretical physics, in explaining atoms, molecular vibrations, knowledge, and more knowledge. I didn't want to do it. But then, Hitler not only swallowed up half of Poland, he invaded the West. And two days later, there was an invitation to a Pan-American Congress, where Roosevelt, whom I have never seen before, was going to speak. And he made a remarkable speech, how the world is really endangered by Hitler. Among other things, and at the climax, he said, you scientists are blamed for the weapons to be used. But I tell you that if you now won't work on weapons, the freedom of the world will be lost. Now, you know, I had the feeling that Roosevelt was talking to me. I was there when the letter was signed that awoke his interest in nuclear energy. I thought I knew he was talking about nuclear energy of the 2,000 scientists there, I felt he was talking to me. Of course, not to. But in that 20 minutes talk, I, my mind was made up. I continue to like better to work on pure science. But this had to be done. And as long as it had to be done, and I could contribute, I did, and was never sorry for having done it. I really wasn't. I wanted science. I loved what I was doing, understanding atoms, molecular vibrations. I had a very good friend, another Hungarian, 10 years older, Leo Silat. Peculiarly strong feeling for the future. Years ahead of time, he knew nuclear explosions were coming. And he saw the danger from the Nazis. At the appropriate time, he asked me to help him. He could do anything but drive a car. He was, I was his chauffeur to drive him to Einstein when he signed the famous letter that got Roosevelt involved in the project. Then, you know, 
months later, almost a year later, when Hitler invaded the lowlands and became very clear to everybody, including me, that now there is real great danger. I went to a Pan American Congress where Roosevelt talked to us scientists of the great immediate dangers. And he said, you scientists are blamed for the weapons. But I tell you, if you are not going to work on the weapons, freedom throughout the world will be lost. I knew Roosevelt knew about atomic explosions. Perhaps of the 2,000 people, scientists, who were there, only Roosevelt and I did happen to know about that. And I had a not quite reasonable feeling that he, of course, not knowing me at all, was talking to me. I then made up my mind. It had to be done. And to the extent I, it had to be done, I will work on it. And to know more about that is something that must be done. I was never sorry to get committed to it. Nuclear explosives are 50 years old. As science and technology goes, that's not a long period. People always imagine they already know things. They don't. We find new things all the time. And more knowledge is important. For a lot of the intervening period, to have bigger explosions was very important. Now we learn more and more how to make things accurate. Precisely aimed weapons become more important, and how to make many cheap explosions becomes more important. But I don't want to tell you that that is what has to be done. Because in research, in acquiring more knowledge, you never know what is really interesting. Let new people, let young people find out. And one branch that is very important, in nuclear explosions, you produce enormous pressures. You can compress normal materials, like iron, to double their density. What materials do at high densities is a whole new branch of science. The simple fact is that knowledge for weapons and knowledge for pure science is not so far apart. In the coming, I hope, more peaceful period, it is very important that people work together in acquiring more knowledge. But not to test, not to have more knowledge, is wrong. Okay. Dr. Keller, take six. Many people thought about it. We discussed it a lot. At the end of the war, most people wanted to stop. I did not. Because here was more knowledge. And in the coming uncertain period, with a dangerous man like Stalin around, and our incomplete knowledge, I felt that more knowledge is necessary. Among the people who knew a great deal about the hydrogen bomb, I was the only advocate of it. And that is, I think, my contribution. Not that I invented it. Others would have. And others in the Soviet Union did. But I was the one person who put knowledge and the availability, the availability of knowledge above everything else. And I must say, it appears that that um, appealed to Truman, and he made the right decision. How long? Uh, one minute. Dr. Keller, take seven. Dr. Keller, if you had 50 more years, what would you accomplish? Well, you know, I hope I will. By that time, I will be only 136 years old. I can tell you what I'm now very interested in, superconductivity. The way how electrons get organized in a solid so that they cannot be stopped. 
basic knowledge, surprising phenomena like superconductivity at high temperatures was not known even a few years ago. The next 50 years will be of enormous interest to everybody in understanding life, in understanding atoms in greater detail, and I want to be there, watch it, participate in it as much as I possibly can. Take eight. Dr. Keller, people consider modern physics too mathematical to understand. What is your opinion? That is one of the big tragedies. That the great discoveries like relativity and quantum mechanics is now considered mathematically too complicated, like rope dancing. That even intellectuals don't look into it carefully. You know, if that had happened a few hundred years ago, would have been that after a hundred years of discovering America, people would not have realized that the world is round. The news in science is not that it has become too mathematical. The news is that it has become surprising. That we have to get acquainted with new ideas, like the fact that two things appearing simultaneous to one observer may not appear to simultaneous to another. That space and time are a little more intricately, but not in a more complicated manner, connected. More important, in the world of atoms, cause and effect are not connected in the old way, but only through probabilities. And that is not a complication. It is, in a way, something that comes closer to what we feel the world is about. Because last century, people thought about physics as a machine, the world as a machine. The past determines the future. Now we know that the past does not determine the future, that the future is created in every part of the world independently by countless atoms and countless living beings. I think the new science is more simple. It begins to unite the ideas of physics and chemistry. More principles, fewer independent facts, greater simplicity. But it cannot be understood unless you are willing to accept thoroughly new ideas. How much? Uh, 